Did you know most of Roger Moore's running scenes in his Bond films were filmed with a body double? Apparently he felt that he looked awkward when running and so he gave the job to a double in all of his seven Bond films. And did you know that Sean Connery started going bald at a very young age? In all of his Bond films he actually was wearing a hairpiece. I was always under the impression that Connery did not start wearing a hairpiece until Goldfinger where it becomes even more obvious. But apparently this had been the case as early on as Dr. No where at the very least he was wearing a toupee. Or here's a much darker piece of trivia. Did you know that Bond's signature gun, the Walter PPK, supposedly is the gun that Adolf Hitler used to kill himself with? Really blew their mind. Stick around because I decided it was time for another one of the one in every Bond film videos. As today we are looking at one piece of trivia from every Bond film. Let's go. Lois Maxwell was actually considered for the part of Sylvia Trent, but instead she got the part of Miss Moneypenny of course. Imagine if that happened though, she never would have been THE Moneypenny in the first 14 Bond films. Pedro Armendariz, who portrayed Karen Bay in From Russia With Love, was battling terminal cancer during the filming and barely managed to finish the film before he was hospitalized. He committed suicide just weeks after completing his work on the film. It's quite a tragic story. Easily one of Bond's most iconic villains, Arik Goldfinger, was dubbed because German actor Gerd Frobe, who portrayed him, did not speak any English. It's astonishing because I feel it's very seamless. If you ever notice that almost all of the actors in Fundable playing the bad guys are Italian, this is no coincidence. The original story involved the Mafia and the villain Emilio Largo as a Mafia boss. The story of course was changed to replace the Mafia with the organization Spectre. Mia Hama, the actress who played Kissy Suzuki in You Only Live Twice, threatened to jump from a window at the Dorchester Hotel after being told that her English wasn't good enough for the part. Just as they were about to cast someone else, the producers decided to let me continue filming. She was originally going to play Aki, by the way, while Aki was going to play Kissy. The girl swapped roles and Mia Hama became the main Bond girl instead. Ironically, she ended up having less screen time than Aki did. George Lazenby lied his way into the role of James Bond and wasn't an actor. The story of how Lazenby got the part can make a whole video on its own. Most of his stories can be heard in detail in the Becoming Bond George Lazenby documentary by Hulu, which I highly recommend and by the way also reviewed on this channel years ago, in case you're curious. The short version is, Lazenby pretended he had acted in all kinds of Eastern European countries he knew they never could check on. He also rushed his way into the casting director's office right past to the receptionist girl saying I heard you are looking for James Bond. After getting in way over his head he eventually confessed to director Peter Hunt that he never acted a day in his life. Peter Hunt burst out laughing and told him you just fooled two of the most ruthless people I ever met in my life. You're an actor, stick to your story and I'll make you the next James Bond. And the rest, of course, is history. Speaking of people with no acting experience, Putter Smith portraying Mr. Kidd in Diamonds Are Forever was actually a jazz musician. They must have really liked his look for the part or something. The alligator farm in Live and Let Die is a real life crocodile farm owned by one Ross Kananga. His father had been eaten by one of these beasts. Kananga obviously made an impression on the filmmakers as it was decided that his farm would be written into the script and even his name was going to be used for the main villain. 
Most of the stunts performed with these crocodiles in the film were all done by Ross Kananga himself. And did you know that one of the two schoolgirls in The Man with the Golden Gun, the one with the shorter hair, was actually the real life daughter of the head of the Japanese Secret Service at the time? Talk about a cool connection when playing in a spy movie. When driving the Lotus Esprit up onto the beach in The Spy Who Loved Me, we can see a child pointing to the car in the water. This child is played by Richard George Keel, the son of Richard Keel who played Jaws in the same movie. Moonraker is obviously well known for being the Bond movie which sees Bond going into space. And did you know that in the end credits of the film, the list of locations given actually includes outer space? What a cool wink to the audience. Carol Bouquet playing Melina in For Your Eyes Only had a sinus problem which disallowed her to do underwater filming. So all of the close up underwater shots of Bond and Melina were shot in an entirely dry studio and not underwater. They were shot at a higher frame rate with wind machines. Derek Meddings, the special effects man, added the bubbles in afterwards. If you are like me and you're a Bond fan that isn't from the United Kingdom, chances are you may have been confused with this little moment in Octopussy. Sit. This is a reference to Barbara Woodhouse, England's premier dog trainer who used the same gesture to teach the sit command to her clients' dogs. I'm sure to British audiences at the time that they totally got the reference, but for a lot of people now, this probably went completely by their heads. Wow. What a view to a kill. This line in itself already doesn't make that much logical sense and is mostly just Christopher Walken saying the movie title and then nodding as if he had said something really impressive. But apparently the Scandinavian translators had even more trouble translating the subtitles for this line. From what I gather in Sweden and Norway this line was misunderstood and the subtitles would say, wow, what a few, yeah, Tokyo. I mean, it's not even Tokyo to begin with, so Swedish and Norse audiences must have been even more confused than we were with this line. If you ever wondered why General Pushkin was the head of the KGB in the living daylights instead of General Gogol, who we've seen as the actual head of the KGB in all Bond movies since The Spy Who Loved Me up until this one, it's actually something the filmmakers were planning to do. However, Walter Gotel, playing General Gogol, fell ill and the producers could not get him insured. Cubby Broccoli was even prepared to pay an extensive sum personally but still could not get the coverage. Even the woman that Gogol is often seen with in his previous appearances was also supposed to be in this film instead of Pushkin's girlfriend. Luckily though, there still is his cameo appearance at the end of the film, marking the final time we see the character in a Bond film. During production of License to Kill, bizarre events happened during the filming of the action sequence with the trucks in Rumorosa, Mexico. The road was actually closed off because of these weird occurrences and was supposedly haunted. If you watch the old special edition DVD documentary, you will hear the cast and crew mention a lot of these bizarre events, like the trucks moving by themselves at night time and perhaps the most bizarre was this still of a fiery hand complete with what looks like five fingers coming out of the explosion and looking completely unpart of it and it was only seen on the still yet when they looked at the camera footage the hand wasn't there. This still amazed the filmmakers to this day. 
For a down-to-earth guy like myself, not really into supernatural stuff, it's still fascinating to hear these stories in the making of documentary. The Dish in Cuba in Goldeneye dubbing as the secret base of 006 isn't a prop designed for the film, nor is it in Cuba. It's actually the Arecibo Observatory, an antenna in Puerto Rico designed to look into space for radio waves and other signs of intelligent life. I definitely agree with the location scouts that it made for a perfect location of a Bond villain in a Bond film. In Tomorrow Never Dies, Terry Hatcher playing Paris Carver was three months pregnant when she was filming her scenes. She apparently also really didn't get along much with Brosnan, who preferred Monica Bellucci for the part. Terry Hatcher said she only took the part to fulfill her then husband's ambition to be married to a Bond girl. The traffic warden in The World Is Not Enough is not an actor nor an extra on a film set. He is a real life traffic warden who was featured in BBC's short lived Traffic Warden series, supposedly by the name of Jeremy. His reaction when Bond blazes by with a speedboat also wasn't acting. He actually had no clue the spray was going to be that intense. Did you know that the Ruby Eon Real Hotel that Bond visits in Die Another Day actually is a mix of references to the series? Ruby for the 40th anniversary of the James Bond series, Eon for Eon Productions and Royale for Casino Royale, the first Ian Fleming James Bond novel. And speaking of Casino Royale, that has the famous shot of Daniel Craig rising from the sea in his swimming trunks. Did you know that this shot was created purely by accident? The reason why Craig suddenly rises is because of the simple fact he walked on a sandbank. The filmmakers liked the way it looked so much and used it for the final film. If you've watched my full review on Quantum of Solace, you will be aware that I find the story to be very confusing and all over the place. This in itself definitely has everything to do with the 2008 writer's strike. Alongside a tight schedule and a fast deadline, director Mark Forster and Daniel Craig were forced to write up parts of the script while already filming the movie. Forster describes it as an intensely stressful experience he would never want to go through ever again. M's house in Skyfall is the former home of legendary James Bond composer John Barry. The filmmakers thought it would be a loving tribute to the late composer and I simply have to agree. During the filming of Spectre, Daniel Craig got injured on his knee and was unable to run in a large portion of the film. The filmmakers tried their absolute best to mask this, which I think they succeeded with. The foot chase in the pre-title sequence is a very good example of the filmmakers improvising. Bond chasing Skiara was supposed to be a high speed foot chase, but because of the inability to run, they kind of masked it by making this more of a stealth run in the crowd, instead of having him sprint. And last but not least, Ana de Armas playing Paloma is definitely regarded among the fandom as one of the highlights to No Time to Die in her brief but badass appearance in Cuba alongside Bond. However, she was so worried that her action sequence would not be good enough with only three weeks of training. She kept saying to director Fugunaga, I just have had three weeks of training. And she just kept saying it all the time until the director said, you know what, you should say that in the movie. And thus, they translated that into the film. This is gonna go brilliantly. I know, I've done three weeks training. And judging by the fact that it is often proclaimed to be one of the best bits in the movie, she definitely did not have to be concerned. Three weeks training? Really? More or less. Still gonna need that car. Salut. Salut. And that was one piece of trivia for every Bond film.
I hope you enjoyed this fourth installment in the One in Every Bond film series. Like and subscribe if you liked the video, leave a comment below and if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, have a look at my Patreon page. Not only are there great perks and rewards for supporting the channel, you also help build towards the release of the big top 25 Bond films video as soon as the next Patreon goal is reached. See you guys in the next video.